Today's teaching text is from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. In a small Roman Catholic church in Borja, near the city of Zaragoza, the 19th century artist Elias Garcia Martinez painted a beautiful picture of Christ called Behold the Man. It's a picture of Jesus with a crown of thorns right before his crucifixion. This picture became the center of this community. It reminded them that Christ understood their, stuff, their sufferings and they felt seen and loved and known. Like a lot of art due to the climate, the frescoes slowly begin to fade and it looked like this. And the people were saddened because the image they loved of Christ and their community was fading away. Then out of somewhere, it appeared that someone had vandalized the work. Next slide. Someone had vandalized the work. <laughs> Police began an investigation but ceased when an elderly woman in her 80s, Cecilia Jimenez, stepped forward and said that she loved Jesus and she loved this picture of Jesus and concerned that it was fading away. So in her spare time, she stepped up and <laughs> restored the fresco. <laughs> Unfortunately for Cecilia, she lived in a time of history with the internet. Next slide. And memes. Next slide. And so began, next slide. And so began, next slide. And so began, next slide. That's a Halloween costume. Oh, a lot of empathy at the 4.30 service tonight. Now, I bring this up because in some sense, many people say that this is what has happened with the resurrection of Jesus. People say that Jesus was probably a historical figure, uh, probably a kind man, probably in his heart a revolutionary, sick and tired of the oppression of Rome. And he tried to revolt and teach about love, but like power always does, it crushed him and his simple, sincere life was slowly fading away. But people love Jesus and so they tried to resurrect this story of Jesus. And so they took this fading historical figure and endued him with supernatural power, established the myth of the Son of, the God, Son of God. And as a result, various memes of Jesus have been shed through history and society, which brings us here today. But is this really what has happened? Is Jesus just a failed historical figure who was imbued with power by his sincere but deceived followers? Are the 2.3 2 billion people celebrating the resurrection of Jesus today nice but deluded people? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Nicholas Kristof in his New York Times column, every now and then he does one called Pastor Am I Saved? Pastor Am I a Christian? And he did one uh, this past week with the president of Union Theological Seminary here in New York, Serene Jones. And he asked her, do you believe in a physical resurrection of Jesus? And her response was this, when you look in the Gospels, the stories are all over the place. There's no resurrection story in Mark, just an empty tomb, which is actually not quite true. Those who claim to know whether or not it has happened are kidding themselves. But that empty tomb symbolizes the ultimate love in our lives cannot be crucified and killed. I encourage you to read this article. 
Because when you do, you will realize that to take away the historic facts of the resurrection is to basically reduce the scriptures to a kind of sentimental poetry. And with all genuine due respect to Serene Jones, she's fundamentally wrong in her assumption of what is happening here. She believes that if Jesus wasn't risen, it doesn't matter if he rose. It doesn't matter if there's a heaven or hell. It's basically be loving because love is the meaning of life. But you don't need morality or religion or ethics or Jesus to have any of that. Why bother with a Christian faith that's just a shell of its historic tradition? It's so much easier to just live for yourself and let people do their thing while you do yours. In fact, the Apostle Paul functionally says this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are above all people to be pitied. See, the writers of the New Testament don't think it doesn't matter about the physical resurrection. They think if it's not real, you're wasting your time. So they put forth the the resurrection of Jesus as a central assumption. One theologian says this, commenting on what I've mentioned so far, apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's no savior, no salvation, no forgiveness of sin and no hope of resurrected eternal life. Apart from the resurrection, Jesus is reduced to yet another good but dead man and is therefore of no considerable help to us in this life or at its end. Plainly stated, without the resurrection of Jesus, the few billion people who worship Jesus as God are gullible. Their hope for a resurrection life after this is the hope of silly fools who trust in a dead man to give them life. Subsequently, the doctrine of Jesus' resurrection is without question profoundly significant and worthy of the most careful consideration and examination. So that's what I want to do tonight. I want to give a a short but careful and worthy examination of why it is that Christians insist on the resurrection of Jesus. So I want to look at this from three angles. Number one, why why from an existential personal sense we need this resurrection? Why uh, in terms of a new kind of power being released in the world we need the resurrection? And why our hearts need a savior like the one that the Bible teaches? So let's jump in here. Number one, God's provision for our problem. This is why Christians insist on a resurrection. Look at what verses 5 through 8 say. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified on the third day and be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Now, we have just come off. If you're visiting us today, it's great to have you. We've just finished up a Lent series called Words from the Cross. And on the cross, Jesus gave seven words, seven statements while he was on the cross that give us a rich understanding of what he was doing there. And uh, some people have pointed out to me, uh, some people, sort of anal retentive people, have pointed out, hey, you only did six of the seven uh, words from the cross and I can't live without closure. Well, that was on purpose. (laughs) The seventh word from the cross that I say for this point right here is this phrase that Jesus uses where he says it is finished it is finished to tell us die it's finished there's nothing else to be done now this phrase here is what sociologists call a condensed symbol a condensed symbol means that there's there's a picture or an icon that within it when you touch it you're basically accessing an entire system of meaning present in that one image And that's what's happening on the cross. That's what's happening in this particular phrase. The the word to telestai in the first century had a huge range of meanings. So to bring it up was not to mention one thing. It was to paint a rich portrait of what's gathered around it. And what the angel says to the women here is this. Remember, Jesus had to be handed over to sinners and crucified. Remember, there's, there's a problem that you have with God because of your sin. And Jesus has had to deal with that. Remember, remember. And Jesus' response on the cross is to tell us, it is finished. Well, what is Jesus telling us in this phrase? Five things. The first one, the word to tell us, was used when a servant finished their task. We actually have an ancient account of a secular author who sent his son on a mission. It was actually family business. And he said to his son, go and complete the business and don't come home till you're done. And the son kept trying to come home and his father was like, when you're finished, you can return. And he eventually sends a letter in that says, to tell us die, it is finished. And his father allows him home. This was the idea of not returning until the mission or the task was complete. And on the cross, Jesus as the servant of God, 
as he says, is returning to his father because he's finished that for which the father sent him into the world to accomplish salvation. The second way that to tell a star was used was amongst the priests. Priests would examine animals for blemishes before they were sacrificed because they, they had to offer perfect sacrifices in the temple. And if the lamb was faultless, perfect, after it had been inspected, the priest would step back and say, to tell us, the inspection is done. It's finished. And Jesus is the lamb of God, the only man who's ever lived that was, out, was without sin, who could offer himself as an unblemished sacrifice before God. Artists, when the painter of a sculpture or somebody working with a marble had finished their work, they would step back for a minute to observe if there were any changes or details that need to be corrected. And when they step back and realize there was nothing else to do, they would sort of mumble under their breath lovingly, to tell us die, to tell us die. It is finished. Merchants. In the suburbs, there's this concept, you might have heard of it. It's, people have these things called houses, and sometimes if you can't pay cash for the house, you have to borrow money from the bank. It's called a mortgage. And that means that the, the bank holds this note, and when you pay it off, they will send you a deed to the property. And uh, people say, I, I have a mortgage on a home uh, in the Pocono Mountains. And uh, people say, oh, when did you buy your house? I'm like, oh, I actually co-owned my house. I'm like, oh, really? With him? I'm like, yeah, I'm in an arrangement with Wells Fargo. It's amazing. <laughs> They've never bothered to come and take advantage of their ownership of my home. But I'm grateful for it. And I work and work and work, and hopefully one day in the not-too-distant future, while I still have strength in my legs to enjoy the mountains, that at some point I'm going to make my final payment, and they're going to send me the deed to the property. And when they do, I'm never going to have to pay again. It's going to be mine. And in essence, this was the ancient concept to tell us, when there was a debt that you owed, and when you finally paid it off, they would give you a, statistic, a certificate that you could stay up to tell us, which means no more payments. And then lastly, prisoners, when a Roman citizen was convicted of a crime, he was put in prison and a certificate of debt listing his crimes was nailed to the cell door so that people passing by could see the list of charges and the penalty. When the prisoner had served his sentence, was released from bondage. The indictment was taken down from the door and the person who had assigned, had committed him to prison would write across it to tell a story and that deed was given to the prisoner. So if ever charged again, he could present it and say, paid in full, I don't have to do any more time. Now, here is Jesus on the cross, and what is he saying? He's finished the mission of redemption. He is the perfect Lamb of God. All types and shadows are fulfilled in him. There's no more debt for us to pay, and as prisoners of sin, we can go free. And this is what the angels announced. Remember that this is what Christ came to do, to die for your sin. And I love this. This is good news. Now, for the typical person in the city at this point, we're like, look, honestly, all this talk about sin, that's depressing. Look, man, people are just trying to do their best. We may have taken away the language for sin, but we have not taken away the reality or the experience of sin. So many people who are not from New York but move here, they do so in some sense because they're, cry they're trying to sort of rebirth their lives. They, they want to be in places where they're not known for all those mistakes they, they made. The problem in living in the same place your whole life is that everybody remembers everything you've ever done. In New York, people just remember when you got here or when they first met you. And so, so many times people come here for some version of a new start or a new life. And no matter how successful people end up being, deep, deep down inside, a lot of people realize there's things I wish I could undo. There's things I wish I could make atonement for. There's things I've done against God, against my own conscience, against other people. And they can feel tremendous shame and pressure and a desire to be rid of these things. But no matter what they do, it still sort of haunts their spirits. And that's what the reality of sin is. And Jesus came to deal with the penalty of our sins, the things we've done towards others, but primarily the things we've done towards God. And so when Jesus stands between us and God and he says, it's finished. There's no more to pay. There's nothing you have to do. It's a gift of grace. I've come to rescue you. This brings such joy and such relief to those who respond to it. So the reason that Christians insist on the resurrection of Jesus is because it follows the cross of Jesus where our fundamental human problem has been solved. But the second thing that is happening here, the second reason Christians insist on the resurrection is because it's God showing us his power over our enemies. This is what they say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen. I love this because all of us, deep, deep in our hearts, 
fundamentally wrestle, wrestle with the reality of the physical universe. We, we all do. We live in a society obsessed with youth. And we sense tremendous shame around our bodies. It's very, very rare to meet someone who's basically like, I look perfect. <laughs> very, very rare. And even if they did, what they paid to look perfect. And what they're going to have to try and do to keep perfect. And how awful they look in their later years when everybody realizes how much work they did to try and stay perfect. We all feel this sense of shame. I came across the work of a young African-American artist, Mikau Chikwuma Uwunu, and he did these beautiful images of, of what he basically articulates. This, this series was called Infinite Essence. And he said he was just tired of the pervasive media images of black people dead, dying, gunned down by police officers, drowning wash, and washing up on the shores of the Mediterranean, starving he said he felt like that the only images that society showed were negative images of the black body. And so he wanted to recast them with this profound sense of beauty. So he took these people, some who experienced tremendous physical shame, and he personally painted them, hand-painted them like this. And then using ultraviolet light, he's actually a very, very well educated multidisciplinary sort of artist, used ultraviolet light and snapped in just one second their bodies illuminated as if they, they were a universe of possibility. This next one's my favorite here. Hand painted. And this is, he said, when people saw what was possible, the beauty that was actually implicit within them, some of them wept. Some of them wept. They'd just never seen themselves this way. Well, this art just stirred my thinking, not just about what's happened to African Americans who in our society have experienced more than others. But it pushed me out to, the, to just all of the shame that we feel as a part of our human condition. We are all in some sense embarrassed by the fact that our bodies are decaying and will one day die. This denial of death, this, this fear of growing older in many ways drives our whole society. 1973, Ernest Becker wrote a book called The Denial of Death, won a Pulitzer Prize. And he basically says that human beings live in contact, the conflict between their physical bodies and a spiritual sense, a transcendent sense. And that with the decline of religion, we are impoverished and don't have the resources necessary for the illusion of building an immortality project. Now, here's what he's saying is that if we honestly thought about what our deaths would be like and the fact that all of us would die, we would be so gripped by fear and disillusionment, we'd barely be able to function. And so we're pushing it off in this quest for immortality. This is uh, a concept that people use called terror management theory, and it's basically a way of dealing with our psychic angst. We're all walking around seconds from our deaths, but in order to not come to terms with that reality, we have to manage this terror. Now, one of the, now it's, it's fascinating because even churches can sometimes fall into this trap. Uh, out in the, the suburbs and in the country where mortgages are primarily, um, you would drive through and you would see these, you would see these churches, and a traditional church, beautiful churches, would often have attached to them the graveyard. And so it was, it's often very, very moving to, to pull over and to walk through a graveyard and see all the lives of these people, their hopes, their fears, their dreams, their longing, their hatred, all of the things. And they were members of this community who had died. And the church somehow set up an architecture and use of space that reminded you that this thing happening in the church had something to do with the people who were in the grave. But modern churches don't have cemeteries. Modern churches have coffee shops. And I'm like trying to kind of wonder like what sort of image we're saying with our architecture. Hey man, just can't drink coffee. I don't know what that is, but it seems that we've sort of lost the sacred meaning of space, even in how we design modern spaces. The church is fundamentally designed to deal with this problem, the great embarrassing problem of the death of our bodies. In the book Immortality by Stephen Cave, a fascinating and insightful read, he basically says that people utilize four strategies in their terror management theory of death. The first one, he says, the way that we try and live forever is through our legacy. It's accomplishing. It's art. It's in business. It's on the stage. It's becoming a legend. And our vision is that even after we die, we'll live lives of such consequence and significance that people will reference us above the mass of humanity as those doing an enduring work. 
Now, the problem with this theory is that people have smartphones and social media lets you document every magnificent, amazing, sincere, authentic, non-manufactured moment of your life. And so we just, and you know, half the world's population is under 16. The kid, the future is theirs, not ours, folks. So these kids are just documenting everything. Now, how do you break out when over 7 billion people How do you do something so significant that all of these people obsessed with their own lives are going to go, oh, no, truly, you are a great one? How do we do that? It's so hard and so exhausting to try and live a life of such legacy that you'll live forever. Well, if that doesn't work, another strategy that people utilize is the progeny strategy. It's basically, let me have a family, let me become a patriarch, multi-generational influence. And a lot of, I think, perfectly timed. And a lot of... A lot of the vision is like, if I can just establish a name, a a meaningful family name, and if I can have children who respect me, and if I can go from, you know, basically passing on blessing, not brokenness, that over the course of time, we can become one of those great families. Maybe it's through progeny. Now, again, the challenge of this is it fails to take into account the nature of teenagers. Um, (laughs) I, I try and, you know, tell my children at times, you know, like I've had a reasonable amount of experience for a man my age. Um, I'm quite well read. I, I got your mother for goodness sake. I've done something right. And all they seem to say to me is, it doesn't sound like wisdom, dad. It just sound like lectures. So even a, recept, even a receptivity to teach them like, look, I could have Googled that in two minutes. I don't need the one hour version, dad. People, generations don't respect each other like they used to. And it's like, did you have a phone when you were growing up? But then your lies are relevant to me. You have no reference point. Progeny is hard. Then another shift that people make is basically biology. And this is where people think we're going to solve the problem with our bodies. We're going to solve the problem with death by technology. Trust me, we're so close to the singularity. 2040, we're going to be there. They're going to drop tiny robots into our bloodstream that just like go through us and cleanse us. We're going to live forever, at least into the hundreds of years. The obsession with longevity studies, the obsession with people freezing eggs or freezing their entire bodies in an attempt to stave off time to live into the future is quite high. And I'm always haunted whenever I think about this. Peter Thiel and Simon Cowell getting blood infusions of younger men so they can have more energy. No, really. (laughs) Taking the blood of younger men and pumping it through their bodies. You would never do anything like that, but you use creams. You use creams on the outside, and if you could afford it, you'd probably do the blood. (laughs) My point is, all of us do things to fend off aging. And then the last option is what he calls a religious option, which is resurrection. It's like, this is the last one. If you can't do it through family or accomplishments, if you can't do it through technology, then you have to do this through religious resurrection. Now, here's what he says, honestly. The problem is, is that all religions basically teach the same thing. And that's that if you're good enough, you get another shot. But we all know it's just not true. So at the end of the day, just try and be present. It'll be over soon. (laughs) Author Luke Ferry, who wrote a fascinating book, I highly recommend it, not a Christian at all, but a book called A Brief History of Thought. He sought out to study, compare, and summarize 2,000 years of philosophy. And in his studies, he says this, there's actually nothing, even though he doesn't believe in it, there's nothing like the claims of Christianity. He said, Christianity is the only religion, and this is how it overcame the Greeks and the Romans, their level of thought in the first centuries, where death has been defeated by love. Listen to him. The Christian response to mortality for believers, at least, is without question the most effective of all responses. It would seem to be the only version of salvation that enables us not only to transcend the fear of death, but also to beat death itself. And by doing so in terms of individual identity rather than anonymity or abstraction, it seems to be the only version that offers a truly definitive victory of personal immortality over our conditions as mortals. It is this new definition of love found at the heart of the new doctrine of salvation, which finally turns out to be stronger than death. He understands this in in giving a survey and overview of philosophy. There's no claim like the claims of the Christian truth that God has overcome for individuals he knows and loves death by conquering death on their behalf. But again, he says, it's just too good to be true. It's just too good to be true.
But Christians believe it's not too good to be true. Christians believe it actually happened. Christians believe that, that God came into this realm and that he disrupted the brokenness of this realm, conquered its enemies, and then is gifting back into this realm through the life of Jesus, eternal life. Ernest Becker says the resurrection means the worst things, never the last thing. And this provides tremendous hope for Christians. Death doesn't have the last word. Sin doesn't have the last word. Cancer doesn't have the last word. AIDS won't have the last word. Injustice doesn't have the last word. Violence won't have the last word. Jesus has the last word. I got a text from a friend of mine last night. And he sat by the de- his mother as she died and sung over her, It is well. And while singing It is well last night, she passed into eternity. And I just thought of the power of that moment. You see, in our society, we sentimentalize death. We say things like, they're in a better place. But if there's no resurrection, they're not in any place. They're gone. Or we say, I hope they rest in peace. Actually, they're not going to rest in peace. If you were to dig them up, you would find them slowly decaying. There would be a terrifying snench, and you would be horrified and traumatized to see a decaying body. But we do everything within our power not to confront the reality of that. But Christians are saying, no, we can confront the reality of that with resurrection hope. We believe Jesus came back and broke the power of the grave and has physically raised from the dead. And he takes the spirit that enabled that to happen and he puts it inside of us and gives life to our mortal bodies. This is an extraordinary claim. Now, here's the thing. Even if, and, and you, you have to do your own research as to, as to sort of what happened with the body. I gave a talk on it last year if you're interested in watching. But it, it's, it's a pretty, if it's a, if it's a total delusion, it's probably the best one ever played on the human race ever. There's a lot of good uh, belief in the empty tomb, a lot of scientific historical stuff that you could go into. But that's not the point I'm trying to make tonight. Here's the point I'm trying to make tonight. The Bible promises that because that happened with Jesus, he'll put his spirit inside of you. And when you actually experience not the historical figure of Jesus and not the theology of to tell us die on the cross, but when you experience that internally, like the Bible says, it's called being born again, regenerated. When you experience that, it will change you forever. You will feel a resurrection from deadness to life. You'll feel a resurrection of hope and joy and peace and purpose in your life. And many, many people, this is the reason well, they end up following Jesus, not the history or theology. You often find skeptics who start, start out very, very cynical about the reality. They basically think this is a myth. This is like the woman painting over the portrait. And so they let me do the research and they do the research and they start going, wow, the historical proof of this is very, very high. And they study philosophy and like Luke Ferry, they say, actually, this is quite compelling and beautiful. And they go closer and closer, but they're brought to this moment of faith where they realize this is personal. And this isn't just a theory. The gospel, the gospel of John opens with Jesus saying, what are you looking for? And it closes with Jesus saying, who are you looking for? It shifts from theology to person. And that's why many of these people, when that God draws near and fills them with their spirit, the only way they can describe it, it's like being born again. And honestly, when you think about your life, you will die. You will die. And you could fend it off, you can have all your own strategies, your own version of terror management theory. But are you ready to leap into the void without seriously considering the possibilities or the options? The Stoic philosophers had a concept called the premeditation of evils. Well, what they would do is they'd sit down and they'd think about the worst possible things that could happen. So when they arrived, they were not naive and taken by surprise. And that is a missing concept. Many, many intelligent people say, yeah, I know there's a lot of theories about all of that. I guess I'll just face it when I'm done. It'll be too late then. You owe it to yourself to at least crack the door of possibility and explore Jesus' claims to have defeated our enemies. Now, the third thing that it shows is not just God meeting our need, sin, and God not just destroying our enemies, death, through his power. But the third thing, it shows us what it is that God's actually after. What is he's actually after? See, I, I, and some people, this is where people feel conflicted about the Christian scriptures. Sometimes people say to me, look, I read the Gospels. And honestly, I mean, they're, they're weird. The end of the Gospels is weird. Aren't you slightly embarrassed about the end of the Gospels? And I'm like, look, I mean, yes, I'm slightly embarrassed by the end of the Gospels. Because if I was going to write a hero myth to compel the world to believe in Jesus, I would not have written it like this. 
You know, there's this woman, her name's Mary Magdalene. Uh, she had seven demons in her, and uh, Jesus kicks those out. And then she's the first person to witness the resurrected Jesus, and she doesn't really recognize him. That's not how I'm going to open my heroic encounter of the resurrection of the Son of God. And in fact, many of the things that I find embarrassing are the kinds of things that are actually true. You wouldn't put them in there. This is not Joseph Campbell's hero myth right here. This is not like cross that narrative that you can join yourself. This is not it. This is a little bit embarrassing. It's like nobody expected Jesus to come back from the dead. And when he did, they sort of all screwed up and said really dumb things. <laughs> Mary is the first one. And then you know the story of Peter. Peter's like, Lord, if, if nobody, nobody denies you, you know, if everybody denies you, I won't. And then about a minute later, he's like, who is Jesus? I've never even met Jesus in my life. And then Peter goes back fishing as if it's never happened, as if he never met Jesus. Just tries to put it behind him and go back to where he started. And then Jesus shows up on the beach. And he's like, hey, Peter. Peter's like, hey, Lord. <laughs> and, and then Jesus, do you love me? And he's like, then he says, what are you doing with the fish, mate? Enough with the fish. Do you love me? Yes. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Your failure does not cancel out your destiny. Get back to your calling. You see this again and again. Your boy Thomas. Now, Thomas's personality, I love Thomas. Thomas is, you know, struggles with optimism. We'll put it like that. If you go through the Gospels, not just doubting Thomas, but consistently through the Gospels, he, he, you know, he's always that guy. And uh, so when Jesus is going to resurrect Lazarus from the dead, what does Thomas say? Okay, let's go die too. That's his actual phrase in the Gospels. <laughs> and it's just like Thomas has this terrible pattern of missing out on everything good when it's supposed to happen. So everybody's like, Thomas, Thomas, mate, you're never going to believe it. Jesus is back from the dead. He's like, are you kidding? Like, no, not at all. He's back. We saw him. And he's like, well, what? again, misses out. So he says, unless I see him and get to put my hands in his in his wounds, I won't believe. And then Jesus in his mercy just appears. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Well, you think about the couple on the road to Emmaus. They're so disillusioned. They literally say, but we had hoped. They've lost all hope. And it's honestly, I think, maybe the most beautiful picture in the Gospels period. A group of people have given up on Jesus. They're walking away from Jesus. And Jesus walks with them while they're walking away from him. What an image. What sort of love is this? Now, the reason I'm bringing up all these accounts is this. If I was back from the dead, there's only two places on earth I would go. Number one, to Rome for the showdown with Caesar. <laughs> Caesar, you call yourself Lord. Shall we take it to the auditorium? <laughs> what, I mean, you know, what can you do to this body? I mean, honestly, it, what an opportunity to display his power and convert the empire in one move. Or I would have gone to Athens and said, folks, you know the Logos? I'm the Logos. Stop debating. I'm here. Let me teach you. And I would have showed up and I would have influenced the world of philosophy. Why doesn't Jesus go to Rome or go to Athens? And this is very important to see it's because Jesus' primary concern isn't convincing and coercing the world through power. Jesus' primary concern is helping his friends who struggle to believe in him believe in him. That's his whole ministry. Now, this is why this is important. Because you would expect in a hero myth for Jesus to rise up and then go and take on the powers of his day and then rule from Rome forever. But it just seems that he's not interested in what humans are interested in. He's interested in love. And this is why this is important. It's one thing to have an all-powerful God who's defeated death. But if he's not loving, what a terrible universe to live in. In, in, in a universe filled with an all-powerful God who doesn't care about people. But to find an all-powerful God who's defeated sin, Satan, death, and hell, who then uses his power to find those who struggle with faith and to be merciful to them, what sort of God is that? That's the God of the Bible. And when you meet that Jesus like these disciples do, when he comes to you through his spirit and he shows you that there actually is hope in the world, this changes people forever. And this is why people, when they read the Gospels and they feel Jesus drawing near to their lives, find tremendous comfort and hope. So, if we look at our world today, I feel like we're just in a culture that's just like drowning in despair. People are just, they've lost all hope in politics. 
They've lost all hope in entertainment. They've lost all hope in economics. They've lost all hope in the family, it seems. It seems like there's, just no, there's no one you can trust. And if we're not careful, this low-grade cynical angst just fills our hearts and we live lives of suffocating despair. But it's into this that Jesus wants to speak. Look at how Ronald Rollheiser puts this. Despair is the death of our sense of surprise. The belief that nothing new can happen to us. We despair at the precise moment when consciously or unconsciously we say in resignation, this is the way I am, this is the way things have always been for me, and this is the way it will always be. For me, it's too late. Listen to this. Once this has been said, we're in a tomb. Much of us is dead and more of us are still dying. Now look, it may be a tomb in the Hamptons, it may be a Couture tomb in the West Village, it, but it will still be a tomb where we would die. And this is what he says, why is this kind of despair so dangerous? Because the resurrection is always, as it was the first time, a surprise. The totally unexpected, the impossible, and that which defies all logic, laws of nature, and the wisdom of common sense and convention. When we have every angle of reality so calculated and figured that we know all the possibilities, then nothing new can come along to surprise us. Sadly, our prophecy then will be self-fulfilling because we've ceased believing in God and grace in a real sense. We've slimmed down God and grace to fit our own small minds. We live not merely in despair, but also in mediocrity. I've said before, but it bears repeating. Spiritual mediocrity, is not, it's not from God. That's something that we invent. God has no toleration or heart for mediocrity. And so what he actually is inviting us to do in this Easter is to crack open the door of our cynicism and despair and let resurrection hope in. You know in your heart that there's things that you wish you could undo, that deep sense of guilt and shame you wish could be undone. Jesus is announcing at Easter, it's finished. I've paid for that. You can be forgiven like it never happened. I can do that for you. Jesus is telling us he has power to, to take on the deep primal fear of the human condition. Death, the loss of all that matters to us through the gift of eternal life. And he offers to be merciful to us, to give us his kindness as we struggle to walk this along. Who is there like that? There's no one. That's why on this day, billions of people pause and say, hallelujah, there's hope in the world. Now, the challenge of this sort of thinking in New York is that honestly, like, where, can you, where can you have conversations, thoughtful conversations like this? Our church believes this is, is good news. This is a tradition we've inherited for 2,000 years. We believe this is good news for people who live in the city. But we spend a lot of time trying to articulate, like, how do we create environments where people can wrestle with this good news and encounter it? It's tough to do it at work, isn't it? Hey, how was the weekend? Oh, it was good. We talked about terror management theory and uh, Peter Thiel putting blood in his body. There was some stuff about the resurrection and angels. Was how was your weekend? I mean, it's, it's tough to find environments to process these things. And so we, we actually have come across something that's been tremendously life-giving. In fact, after every service today, somebody who's been through Alpha has come up to me and said, I met Jesus through Alpha. This changed my life. My experience was exactly like you started at the beginning of your talk and exactly like you ended your talk. I felt and experienced that. And so Alpha is just basically a series of dinner discussions designed to create space for deep, meaningful discussion about things that matter. Life, death, beauty, meaning, religion, hope. It's a space for all of those things. And so what we do is we basically have very hospitable people open their homes. We offer a home-cooked meal with wonderful uh, wine and cheese and every other thing that makes conversations better. And uh, we basically have these environments where each week we have a discussion about things that matter. And the first one begins with this. Is there more to life than this? And every New Yorker deserves to ask that question about their own life. Is this it? Is this it? New York sucks if you accomplish everything because you realize you've accomplished it all and there's nothing left. And it sucks if you don't accomplish it because you'll spend the rest of your life wondering what it would have been like. So if you're successful or unsuccessful, this place will break your heart. There has got to be more to life than this. And so that's week one, is there? And uh, so if you're, if you're genuinely looking for a space to basically sit down and eat a meal and meet some new people and be in a non-judgmental environment to explore this. I would encourage you to do this. So the, the easiest way we know to do this is by up on the phone, you're gonna see a number. And I encourage you to pull out your phone now. Some of you have been taking photos of the slides anyway. You've already cheated in church. So go ahead, take your phone out. And I wanna encourage you just to text Alpha Course to this number. And what we will do is it actually start this week. 
So if you're looking for a place to, to, to show up and discuss, you can have that experience this week. And here's our promise to you. We're not going to store your number. You're not going to get a text at Christmas that says, hey, we haven't seen you in a while. I want to talk about when you showed up in the world. There's like no follow-up marketing connected to this. And it's literally one text that gives you the information and the ability to find out more about how to pursue this. Hundreds of people in our church have been through the Alpha course and millions of people through the world have been through this. So if you're interested in, if you want to like let some hope break into the despair of modern life and meet some new people and process these things, I encourage you to text this. Now, I just want to say this. I've had several friends go through the Alpha course and at the end of it say, I still don't believe in Jesus, but honestly, that was the best experience of my life. The people were amazing. I met such wonderful folks. People were so kind. It was so good to eat a home-cooked meal and have people listen to me. Do you know how much money I spend on having people listen to me? To have people do that for free was amazing. So I encourage you to do this as a response. We're going to spend the next few weeks just talking about these deeper things. And if you're interested in that, I want to encourage you to do it. Okay, that's all we've got time for tonight. Let's finish out our evening just by celebrating and by worshiping the one who has risen from the dead on our behalf. Brothers and sisters, let's worship.